thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the NCTA for having me host and moderate this wonderful panel for opening up your cable show. I'm so excited to be talking uh, with all of you. And, and some of you I've, in, I've interviewed and, and others I've been wanting to interview. So I'm glad I get this chance uh, to do that. So, so let's get started. Uh, the most important personal question I have is for Rob Marcus, which is, Rob, after, after, the deal, after the deal gets done, what are you going to do? You're always picking on me, Betty. <laughs> you know, I've been asked that question a lot over the course of the last couple of few months. And uh, I've said the same thing to everybody. Um, it's way too early for me to start planning for the next chapter. I got a lot of work ahead of me in terms of continuing to run Time Warner Cable between now and closing. So I'm going to focus on that, not allow myself to be distracted with what's next, and we'll see. <laughs> Rob and I, by the way, are neighbors in New Jersey. So I promise you it was not me stalking you outside yeah. during, during this whole thing. OK, so first off, uh, look, the reason why I, and I don't pick on Rob, <laughs> I know I have talked to Rob many times about consolidation in the industry, right? So of course, Time Warner Cable and Comcast, and we heard just yesterday that Comcast is going to be offloading um, about, about uh, almost 4 million subs uh, to, uh, to Charter. Uh, we, we prefer divest, not <laughs> offload. <laughs> so the question is, Jerry, for instance, are you a buyer or a seller here? You don't waste any time, do you? <laughs> Uh, depend, tell me what the price is, and I'll tell you if I'm a buyer or a seller. <laughs> are, you, are you looking? Are you actively looking? Uh, we continue, we're always looking for acquisitions that are, that are strategic and can add value to the company. Uh, it's a unique time in the business. Uh, there is a lot of consolidation. There's um, a lot of geometric changes in technology that I think is, is causing some shifts. And interest rates are, are relatively all-time low, so it's, it's a great time to buy. You know, we kiss a lot of frogs before we find the, uh, the right prints, but we're continuing to look. You know, outside of just looking at consolidation, I mean, in my view, and you correct me if I'm wrong, aren't the big threats really coming from down the, down the pipe with Google, with Amazon, with Netflix? Those are really the big threats right now. Well, I, there are several threats to, to the business. Uh, one is we have a cost structure with our programming costs that are uh, our largest cost component that are growing at double digit rates uh, per customer and that's not sustainable. As you suggest, there's emerging competition from a number of companies that seem intent on getting into this crazy video business. And, um, and there's a, as I mentioned, there's a, a significant uh, geometric change in new technology and those, those are kind of the three risks um, we're trying to navigate through them. Betty, I, you know, I, there's this, this very video centric view of the world that causes people to think of over-the-top providers exclusively as threats. Uh, and I, I have a somewhat counter, uh, counterintuitive or counter uh, view of that in that um, clearly over-the-top video is one of the things that highlights the value of the high-speed data connections that Time Warner Cable and other uh, cable providers offer our customers. So the, the, the speeds, the robustness of our HSD offering are made special by virtue of the fact that there's a whole lot of creative people out there delivering their content over those pipes. So yes, it's true that on the video side, there's the potential for competition, which is not bad. It, it drives us to be better than we were. Uh, but I think there's a whole lot out there that makes our offering more valuable. Yeah, I, I would echo that. I mean, look, clearly the big social and digital platforms are competing for eyeballs, are competing for advertising dollars, but we have a better product than they do. And when you see Yahoo announce that what they want to do is to, is to commission two comedy series, they're trying to get into our business. So yes, they are competitive, but kind of shame on us if we don't protect our turf <clears throat> and work together to sell the value of the pay television subscription and the value of the triple play, and because we have a better product with more value that is cheaper on a per hour basis than those companies, and we're allowing them in some ways to, to uh, set the tone of the conversation. We should be setting the tone of the conversation. We have a better product. But John, it's easy for you to say that. You have a great job. First of all, you program sports, <laughs> but second of all, you program live sports. Uh -huh. you're, the, you're sitting pretty these well, days. Well, I, I appreciate that. I do find as I travel around the country that many people would like to have my job. <laughs> and, and almost all those people are willing to tell me what I could be doing better as well. But no, there's no question. Uh, 
that, that we sit in a, a certain catbird seat, right? That uh, live sports is ascendant, and, and right now the, it's the most powerful form of programming on the planet, live sports. And, and we like that, and again, it's, it's part of what we all do together, and, and I'd make the same point. We need to be selling that, and we, we, uh, we have tried to use that to buttress the underlying power of this product to compete against those companies. And I think we need to continue to do that. But even beyond live sports, if you're in the programmatic businesses that, that Nancy is in and, and Turner, we at Turner are in, you know, the explosion of broadband availability and speeds is really dramatically reducing barriers to distribution. And so for companies like us, I think it's fantastic. I think it's great for consumers. I think it's gonna spur innovation. I think it's gonna explode demand and it provides us abilities to get our products and services to more people in more ways and in ways that they want to consume them, uh, which is going to, we think, cement the value proposition uh, of, 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 content. Of, 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 yeah. And so, and we do have a great uh, offering today. I think all the companies that are up here are in great incumbent scale positions to exploit those opportunities. Uh, and, and I think it's great for consumers. I really do. I think the consumers are the ones that are going to win in all this. Well, you know, the one se senior media executive had said to me one time, uh, and, and, you know, and I quote him because I don't want to offend anybody on this panel, but um, he said, look, Netflix is a perfect poster child of the failure of the cable industry to innovate. What do you say to that? I'm highly skeptical of that comment. I, I really don't, I'm not sure I get it. The fact that someone came up with an interesting technique of aggregating and reselling uh, other people's content over the cable infrastructure is in no way, in my opinion, a failure of the cable industry. You're Let seeing me... consumers use both. I mean, we're not, I think that that's what's a little bit missing here. You know, we'd all like to be in a business where we don't have to report our numbers, too. So you, you're dealing with a Netflix and an Amazon that's not sharing their viewership. Um, anecdotally, you know, there's a lot, you hear about House of Cards season two a lot less than you heard about House of Cards season one. But we're not looking at any of those numbers, and they're not sharing those numbers. And so how do you work with the creative entity in terms of going forward and renegotiating future seasons if nobody has metrics to base anything on? So. But you know, when you have a Sony, for instance, come mm -hmm. up to you and say, look at our platform, look at what we can do with your content, what do you say? I mean, it's, look, they were in, they've, everyone's heard the pitch, they heard it at, uh, you know, they saw it at CES, they probably saw it last year at the cable show. It's a beautifully looking platform, and I do wish that, you know, our cable partners um, would take a closer look at, you know, how do we make the consumer experience better and better? That's where the partnership between I think the, the programmers and the operators needs to be um, solidified and you know, let's get out of the way of the negotiations and in, in front of you know, putting the consumer first and putting the experience first or a lot of competitors and a lot of technology companies are going to pass us by. Well, Rob is all Can I, can I uh, take a different view? Um, I don't know who mentioned that about Netflix as a failure of the Great. cable industry okay. to... Uh, are you trying to, to make innovate. name names? Is that but, what you're but to I am, you know, I'm, probably, I'm the gray hair on the panel, literally and figuratively. Um, and I re what I remember is Netflix wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for the cable industry who, who really developed from dial-up internet service to building the best uh, delivery system uh, best, with the fastest speed and most capacity. So there's a lot of companies that are, are in existence simply because we as an industry really spend a lot of time and capital in building the internet business. Well, they're actually existing on the infrastructure that you built and on the content that we produced. Uh, and it's okay, competition is not a bad thing. I mean, what we have to do is respond to it and figure out ways to innovate. I mean, I agree with, with Nancy. And, and I think one thing we're doing now that I think is extraordinarily important is we need to figure out together how to make authenticated television work and to allow people to get their content on every device in an easy mechanism because we can compete there. We have superior content. We have to have superior delivery systems uh, and to distribute that material. So what, I, I, what, just to amplify that yeah, one yeah. point, because I think if, there, if there's a call to action in this convention or gathering, I think it's this. For programmers and distributors to work together to 
continually improve the consumer experience. Uh, you know, authentication or this concept of authenticated mm -hmm. content is a barrier to usage. And I would bet if you poll the majority of the people sitting in the audience and you ask them what's their username and password that was given to them by their platform provider, you know, the overwhelming majority of you all in, in, uh, in the industry probably don't know. I have three homes with three different cable providers. I don't know any of them. So I don't have TV everywhere because I can't figure out how to use it. We have to work together. We have to make it easy. We have to make it consistent. And I think the idea over the next five years of dramatically improving the availability and robustness of video on demand is the biggest single opportunity that we together can create, which and will create value for the distributors and will create value for the program. And the consumer wants it. I mean, we've had in the one short year of our TV Everywhere apps being robustly offered, they've been downloaded more than 11, time, 11 million times across the three core brands. But the authentication of those downloaded apps is not great. And that means it's too difficult to do. Yeah. We, we did have in the 2010 World Cup, one out of every three hours of viewing was on a device other than a traditional television. That's in 2010. We're getting ready to do the World Cup in, in June, and my guess is it'll be somewhere north of that. And what's, and what's your biggest, what's the biggest challenge, John, for you when you see that? The biggest challenge for us is, is our, already articulated by John Martin here, which is we need an easier process of authentication. We need, you know, the people we're competing with in the Silicon Valley do this by Im implication. They, you know, the, once you have something, they can sniff it out and, and deliver you the content. We need to be just as easy as what they do. I'll give you the ha glasses half full perspective on all this. I do think we have a long way to go in terms of authenticated video viewing, but for our part at Time Water Cable, uh, we're making great strides with our TWC TV app. It's available on, I think, on eight platforms now, the most recent of which we announced last week on Fan TV. Uh, but it's on iOS devices, Androids, Xboxes, Samsung Smart TVs. Uh, the, the, the video offering is really available everywhere, and the usage has been uh, pretty impressive and growing very, very quickly. I agree that the process of authentication needs to be even easier, uh, but the early returns are quite good when you think about the fact that this way of viewing video didn't even exist several years ago. Uh, the fact that last month we had a million unique users uh, accessing our video product via something other than a set-top box, I think is, is pretty significant. Well, but, but, but Rob, I mean, so, but then when you hear the programmer say, you know, say that authentic, you know, there's more than just authentication, you know, a, a, as an issue. But let's say you just take that one issue. As a cable industry, as the operators are working on that, though, and as John Martin says, to work together, uh, you've got Silicon Valley, though. You know, you've got the tech companies, though, that are figuring, but uh, I, I, in I'll, that time, in a space of a few months, are able to figure out. Yes, but the, you know, without content, the tech companies are just building platforms. <laughs> Yep. And so they can build away, and and you know, and they may it and, may look and, more beautiful. But to John Skipper's right. point, but without those content, content, those tech companies are creating and, content and we, too now. You know, we like the cable model. Right. We like our dual revenue stream, and I don't want it to go away. <laughs> but, by the way, I, I, it's not either or. I, I I view the opportunity to collaborate with those tech companies as being yep. part of the openness that Time Warner Cable has demonstrated. I, the fact that we're uh, making our video product available on devices and through user interfaces that we don't necessarily control uh, is something that gives customers more choice. So I think this notion of setting up tech companies versus cable providers versus content providers is a, is a false uh, split. Yeah, we, we work with a number of large tech companies. We peer with them, we cash with them. It's all about providing a better customer experience. Look, our customers are going to go uh, uh, to a Netflix and to others and we want to make it easy for our customers because we want to be the provider of choice. And uh, as Rob indicated, um, it, the more and more content that you view online, the more you're going to want to come to the cable uh, high-speed uh, service because it's the best out there. So John Skipper, when are you going to stop gouging Rob and Jerry? Stop doubting them? Gouging. Yeah. <laughs> gouging them with your high, I, I'm high cost that you demand. I, I don't doubt them nor gouge them. <laughs> the, look, hey, that, we, got we, some, that got some applause we, in there. At ESPN, our job is to create value and work with our distributors to sell the, their products in the market. And there's no question that we've created the product with the most value. And it's the most expensive product in the market And, and I don't, to, to create and to sell, and nobody doubts it. Every year they do a survey of what network is the most valuable on your, on your service, and it's always ESPN. 
and we've created a number. We, we work very hard with our partners, with you guys, to try to create value. We were the first in the market with authentication. We've been the first in the market with, with eight, we were the first in the market with an HD channel, first in the market with a 3D channel. So we're open for business to try to do things that create value, and I don't think there's any doubt that in this market that the single greatest buttresser of the t pay television package is ESPN. If you survey people and ask them what they value most in that package, it's ESPN. So I hear this a lot, Betty, and I'm, I'm respectful of you asking the question, <laughs> but uh, we need to be working together because we're providing something of great value that people want. And there's also another canard in the market, which is this notion that only a few people are watching sports and other people are paying for product that they don't watch. 115 million people consume ESPN every week. 86% of people do consume ESPN in a quarter. It's just not the case, no matter how many times Barry Diller says it, that a few people uh, are watching sports and a bunch of grandmothers are, not, are paying for it. It's just not the case. My mother loves it, so it's a grandmother, it's a grandmother in our house that watches lots of ESPN. Yeah. I don't know many people who don't have somebody in the household watching ESPN, so it's a nice rhetorical device. It's just not a fact. But Rob, your predecessor, Glenn Britt, had been on the record quite often and very vocal about the fact that programming costs are, are getting out of hand. Well, I think there's no question that a model where uh, your cost of goods sold is, is growing at a rate that exceeds the amount that the market will bear at retail is problematic for the sustainability of our overall ecosystem. Uh, John's got his own problem. I mean, he goes to negotiate with teams and leagues and conferences about uh, the next round of licensing deals. He's got costs that are also accelerating. So uh, there is a fundamental problem in the ecosystem. I think that at the end of the day, we've got to figure out a business model where uh, our, uh, our willingness to pay for these elements of content, whether it's John or, or a distributor, are more responsive to what customers are actually willing to pay. We've got a disconnect now, which is that for the most part, John's not going directly to end user customers, so he doesn't have that feedback loop to guide what he's willing to pay for uh, product. We're sort of stuck in the middle, and I think that's a problematic element of the model. So we got to figure out how we, we uh, introduce a greater degree of flexibility that gives us more consumer feedback that ultimately drives cost structure. But, but as a wholesaler, our cost of goods sold are going up at or near the same rates. So we're making discrete choices every day about how to make investments in the programming to make our network branded environments as valuable as possible to each of the distributors as well as consumers. Yeah. Look, I don't want to be cavalier about it. Rob is right. There is pressure on prices. It's a $70 billion business, and we're making money. Uh, but since all of us have pressure to grow, we're not going to all grow and make more money unless we can figure out a way, which is why I was advocating, we've got to work together to sell the value of the pay TV sub because if you're going to have a stagnant market, we're all going to have pressure, and we're going to find that what we're doing is discussing who's, who's getting a larger or smaller share of that. There was not this discussion when it was a growing pie, when you were going from 70 million households with pay TV to 80 to 90. We've got to figure out a way to grow the pie if, if we're going to remain together as a group. You know, we're doing what we always do, which is falling into the trap of focusing on this problem of programming cost growth, which is a very real one. Yeah. But I think it's incumbent upon all of us to tout the value of what we deliver to our video customers every day. And, you know, it depends on the calculation you do, but it's not, it's not unreasonable to assume that uh, roughly uh, 20, that, that we essentially charge customers 20 cents an hour of video viewing. Uh, that is a staggeringly good value by any measure. And sometimes Wait, in our... You said 20 cents an hour? 20 cents a viewing hour. Okay. Um, which I think is well worth the price of admission. And very often in the context of these conversations where we do have to grapple with a, a growing uh, programming cost issue, we lose track of the fact that as an industry, we're still delivering tremendous value to our customers. But are consumers at a breaking point, though, at some point? I, th I think there is some segment of the population where affordability is, is a real ish issue. Yeah. And we've got to figure out ways to design products that accommodate those more budget-conscious customers. Uh, for our part, we have light video products, light HSD products that are designed to not necessarily deliver all of the uh, capabilities of the full products, but that meet certain customers' budgetary needs. And, and it's essential that we be able to do that. I'm, I'm concerned we're going to reach a tipping point where uh, we're going to start pricing 
some households, particularly those with distressed household incomes, out of the market. And we need to have the flexibility, working with our programming partners, to be able to offer less expensive type tiers. And so a la carte pricing? Not, not necessarily a la carte pricing, because I, I mean, I, I don't even know how you do that. I mean, my CSRs, are they going to sit there and say, okay, here's 300 channels. Let me go through each one and tell me if you want it or not. But more affordable uh, uh, types of packages that people have more choice than just putting everything in an expanded basic bu bundle. And, and unless we do that, one of three things is going to happen. You're, cable operators are going to have to continue to raise prices, which is, going to, which is not consumer friendly. The government's going to get involved like they are in Canada. They're starting to take steps to do a mandated a la carte. Or operators, and you're starting to see it, are going to have to make tough decisions about what programmers am I going to carry and which ones am I not going to carry. So high so prices. So, so, so what's the consumer given a la carte to some degree already through Netflix, through Hulu, through yes. Amazon? So it may not be a la carte in the way that we thought it could arrive, but the customers have choice, and they're still overwhelmingly choosing cable. But what's okay? But but, but because they want to watch ESPN, or history, or the History Channel, or, or or CNN and TBS. But but look, but what what will be you know, I hear a lot of talk about it, but what will actually, what's going to create that action? When is, when is that trigger going to be pulled that the entire industry starts to, starts to trend that way? At what point? I, I think as some operators decide they're not going to carry certain programmers uh, because it's too expensive, uh, or we continue to see prices rise and pe some people just start disconnecting from cable altogether, I think that's going to put a lot of pressure on all of us if we start hitting that point. Uh, speaking about programs and, and content, I want to ask the programmers. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, clearly you're all looking for the big hit shows, right? You're looking for 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 the next big, uh, you know, the next big Duck Dynasty, right? Or, or, or what's going to be the next big show on CNN? Um, how do you find that? Is it getting harder and harder to find that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. The demand for content has never been greater, and the competition for creative talent has never been greater. Um, you know, I think it's probably the most commonly asked question to, you know, in the Turner Group and certainly in the A&E Group. And um, there isn't a secret machine that we're putting the, you know, the information in and it's not coming out here to do this show. I mean, it's, it's a very intuitive, taste-driven, instinctual part of the business. Um, and I think it's about having um, impeccable relationships with um, IP creators and with showrunners and directors and writers. and. Um, we spend a lot of time in our company focused on that, and, and you know, we get it wrong a lot, but we get it right more, and, and those are the, you know, sort of the odds that we're playing, but I, I worry a lot about, you know, uh, where the next generation of creators is going to come from. Why? You know, I look around and I see a lot of smaller production companies selling for astronomical prices and people... Um, cashing out, and that next crop of of creators is go, is opting to go to YouTube, is opting to go to um, you know Vice, is opting to go different different avenues. And how do we attract them to our platforms and our story, our storytelling and our systems? I mean, yeah. that's well, I, I worry a lot about that. It, uh, as as do we, I think. We've got an advantaged position in that ecosystem, though, because it really is about brands and scale. And uh, I think in order to stay relevant, we're going to need to try to find those tastemakers or those individual voices that aren't being exploited on television today. And for us at Turner, we spend almost $4 billion a year on programming costs. So it feels like we're in a good position to be able to not be outspent by competitive forces, but we've got to have those outstanding relationships with the creative community, which you need to constantly cultivate and turn over. I think it is an amazing development within television that the number one show on television is on cable. Hmm. The number one and the number two, maybe. Right. We're talking about? Walking Dead. Walking Dead. Walking Dead, okay. I think a number of years ago, people would have said that that was structurally impossible. Well, I think it's proven now, if you can find that creative voice, that cable is as good a vehicle as any other vehicle in terms of a network branded environment to reach the consumers. I think it's a great leveling of the plat platform and playing field. I think I would love to see over the next five years any remaining distinction between broadcast and cable just annihilated, blown up, it's irrelevant. 
Uh, we have some of the most profitable television networks in the world. We want to be in the market for the very best projects, and we want the best people working for us. So, but it's getting harder. There's an arms race for programming, and there's more and more outlets for people to express their individuality. All right. Well, I wish we had more time, but we have to wrap up. Thank you so much to a great group of panelists and a great discussion. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Nancy, Jerry, Rob, John, and John.